billion dollar hole eight weeks, that's a lot to consider. And the question is, yet, will there be additional revenue or not? And if it is not, we're going to be talking with the Legislative Analyst Office and the Department of Finance today to see what the legislature's options are to resolve that $15 billion figure without any additional revenue. This is not conjecture, this is our reality. And it is going to seriously impact the citizens, residents, voters, taxpayers of California, our public institutions, our public infrastructure. California will not look the same. We need to prepare for this. We need to inform people as to what the likelihood is and what the ramifications would be. So I'm going to ask Mr. Cohn from the Department of Finance and Mac Taylor from the Legislative Analyst Office to join us. And a little bit of housekeeping, colleagues. Uh, we're going to have this hearing today. I hope that we can be out of here by 1.30. That certainly will be determined um, somewhat by the degree that we are chatty and inquiring. And then next Thursday, we will reconvene, and I would suggest that no one make plans to leave early next Thursday. We'll have a very thorough hearing as a budget committee of the whole to delve into the issue of education, both K through 12 and higher education. We'll have the superintendent of public instruction with us. Hopefully we will have leadership from each of our three higher educational institutions. We'll have representatives from K through 12, all the stakeholders who should be very concerned as to our limited options as the clock ticks near to June 15th. So that's next Thursday. And then of course, when we return from our spring recess, we will have exactly three weeks of work prior to the governor's May revise. And then we're within spit and distance of June. It's all gonna go very quickly. And we've got big decisions to be making. So uh, we'll ask Senator Huff if he's got any comments to make. Otherwise, we'll jump right into it. I wanna get out of here, sir. So. All right. <laughs> there we go. Mr. Cohen, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Michael Cohen with the Department of Finance. Um, the sergeants have passed out just a two-page um, summary of the solutions adopted to date. And um, this, uh, you'll see that the total is $11.2 billion. Um, it does get a little bit confusing in terms of um, crosswalking the, the various solutions between the conference committee package um, what was passed off the floor and what the governor ultimately signed in uh, the various trailer bills. And that's what the $11.2 billion um, ties to are the bills that have been signed by the governor. And so the solutions have been enacted. They are now current law. Um, and so I was just gonna spend a couple moments uh, providing a high level summary of, of this document. Um, first, uh, the section of health and human services reductions, uh, this totals $5.6 billion. So obviously a uh, very large, uh, uh, about half of the overall solutions are coming from health and human services. Uh, the reductions to the Medi-Cal program total uh, about $1.7 billion, uh, the same uh, targeted level as the January 10 budget. Uh, so there, um, as you well know, there's a combination of uh, uh, service reductions, uh, co-pays, um, and reduction in uh, provider rates. Um, in CalWORKs, uh, another billion dollars from a variety of, uh, of changes, including uh, s some major grant reductions, uh, reduction, uh, the continuation of reductions in the single allocation to counties. Uh, the next two major pieces in health and human services uh, relate to propositions and um, redirecting those uh, funds uh, to help the general fund, Proposition 10, $1 billion, and Proposition uh, 63, $861 million. And then, um, as you see, uh, some smaller uh, reductions in, in dollar values in DDS, uh, in-home supportive services, and uh, SSI, SSP. Um, in the education area, a total of $1.3 billion of solutions uh, are reflected um, 
and the enacted solutions. Uh, the vast majority of that is coming from the $1 billion reduction to the university system, so half $500 million uh, from CSU, the other half from uh, the University of California. Here in the education section, um, you'll recall based on the scoring that the uh, major reductions in child care and community colleges are not reflected as a net reduction to the general fund. Instead, those are pieces within the overall Proposition 98 uh, pie, which isn't yielding any um, solution to the bottom line general fund, but those reductions, $400 million reduction to community college apportionments and about $500 million in ongoing
three or four billion dollars, if not more, of cuts to the Department of Corrections. What does that look like? Well, as you can see in the middle group there, we have quite a few recommendations in the area of criminal justice and the judiciary. So we'd be happy, and my staff, my colleagues, would be happy to walk you through those. It might be better to do in a subcommittee hearing where you could really spend time on it. But you can see we've come up with quite a few things in that area. And come to 2.6. In total, yes. Right. Yes, I think so, real quick. Of course, Senator Huff. Yeah, in that same survey where voters were willing to cut corrections, they also perceived that corrections constituted 50% of our budget when it's 10%. So if the perceptions are off, the recommended actions or willingness to go there will also be off. And I think it does deserve a more thorough uh, discussion of this down the road. Senator Hickok. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I, I didn't quite catch what Senator Huff was saying. Do we have to discuss the implications? His suggestion was that it, at least in one if not more polls, the perception of the individual poll was that corrections represents 50% of the state budget as opposed to the 10% it actually does. Well, I think what we want is for members of the public to have as much information as they possibly can. And we're not totally poll driven. We're trying to figure out how to have an economy that will recover and how to keep our people safe. I guess my question, when I look at the corrections budget and the possible implications, I've worked a lot with um, law enforcement groups in the last couple of days and weeks, is that they understand very well there's realignment, which many of them are ready, really ready to to do. I think it shows the confidence that we have in them that we think they could do a better job closer to the community. Um, they are extremely concerned about not having the funds back up the shift in responsibility. But I would say they're even more concerned with the possibility that if realignment is just gone uh, as the way, in the way that the governor proposed it, which was a funded model, that cuts to um, public safety will simply mean that all discretionary money that goes out to local law enforcement will mean that they will be devastated yeah. anyway. And I don't know if you did any, any uh, how you considered what the cuts that you're proposing would actually do to our ability to have safe communities. Well, Senator, we were faced with that on, on, in every program area, whether it's education, higher education, criminal justice, health and social service. As I said, all of these have consequences. Clearly, we tried to do two things. We tried to put forward proposals that minimize those negative consequences. We also tried to allocate the reductions. We tried to target in ways, again, that minimize the impact, as I was going to get to when we get to education try to reduce the cost structure for schools and community colleges. Try to give them, make sure that they focused it on, you know, non-instructional sort of reductions. And I think we try to do the same thing in the courts. I'm sure many people will disagree with us. But you're going to have some impacts. That goes without saying. Well, I think that's right. I mean, when you get to the education part, I, I was going to ask how you factored in the fact that what we hear repeatedly from business leaders and economists is that one of the reasons they're locating in California is what they call the talent, um, the places around great universities. And, um, and if, in fact, the University of California and our CSUs have been an economic engine, um, how do you factor in what the short-term savings there <laughs> might mean for the long-term economic recovery of the state. Did you try to do that? Well, I, I mean, those, that's, it's a very legitimate concern. Um, very difficult to do to say what is a cut today due to that kind of a longer-term return to society, especially if you don't know exactly how the cut will be taken. Now, what we've said in higher ed is 
Um, that does, just because we have a UC budget or a CSU budget, that doesn't mean they can't take reductions and limit the impact of, of the kind of things that you mentioned. We try to focus it on non-instructional sort of matters. Um, maybe you reduce some of your research. Not all research is equal. Not every research dollar generates economic return. And so there may be ways to rethink about the way that the universities deliver their services. How do we do it more cheaply so that we don't have or we minimize the negative impacts that you're referring to? Well, I represent one of our great universities that's in my district. And I will tell you, this is not a formal assessment, but I have had two or three very distinguished faculty people say to me in the last three or four months, not in anger, but in sort of sadness <laughs> and resignation, you know, I'm, I may have to leave here. Um, there isn't a commitment really anymore on the part of the state. I mean, did you look at as options, for example, closing some branches of the university so we could keep some of the flagship institutions, really great college, great university systems? Well, we discussed that. Uh, we didn't end up putting them on the table, but I certainly think that's a reasonable area for you to consider. Uh, that is a really tough one to come in and say where we're going to close down even a relatively new campus, yeah. like Merced, you know, what that does to kind of rile people up. But we've, we've considered things like that. Should you, should you think about, for example, focusing your research at certain institutions? Not every UC campus has to be a full-blown research <laughs> institution. We could have UC, University of California's that were liberal arts colleges. And we could maybe better focus our research so we're not duplicating the same type of thing in each of the 10. So I think it's a very legitimate point to raise. We didn't bring it up here. Again, we did this in a relatively short period of time, Senator Hancock. Yeah, no, I appreciate and so it. And I then just back to corrections, if I could, for a sure. second. Did you look at the impact of essentially releasing um, nonviolent, non-serious, non-sexual offenders um, earlier or have them stay at the community level even if there are no funds to accompany that shift because it seems as though there may not be the funds to keep them at the state level either. Uh, we, if you look in our appendix, we have a whole host of options that relate to that of releasing certain people mm -hmm. earlier, of changing the sentence structures, the parole shift, we wanted to fund local governments, but we would end up saving it. But we have all of those type of options in the appendix center. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and, and you know, really impressing. I want to say that I think we realize that the state of California will be profoundly impacted by the budget cuts that we made already, and that it will really be quite a different place if we have to make another 15, 12 and a half, whatever billion dollars worth of cuts, so that we will be looking at restructuring, that it isn't really just cutting anymore. Well, well, and I think that's a very important point I was going to raise in when we got to education. It is an opportunity, though, to rethink the way that we deliver some services, to rethink the way that the universities provide services. And so there can be some good things that come out of it, but in the short run, it's going to be very tough. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Alquist. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Matt, for the, I'd like to thank you for the presentation. And, and of course, we want to be sure not to shoot the messenger. I mean, I think you did a, a good job of, you know, laying out if you have to make an additional $13.5 billion in cuts, this is one scenario of what it would look like. And so my comments are really, I think, addressed to the public in that uh, I hope the public really understands that uh, California as we know it really is going to change. I was reading an article by the economist um, <laughs> Carmen Reinhardt, who leads a nonpartisan uh, think, tank, think tank. And she said that um, if you look at the recession in terms of a seven-year cycle, 
that we probably have just passed the uh, the third year mark. So we're looking at another, at least another three and a half years. So it's going to be a, a long time that we're going to have to keep uh, tightening our belt. So that's that's the first comment that I wanted to make. Um, I think our constituents are beginning to understand, only beginning to understand the problem. And a lot of them are still saying, we understand, but cut them, don't cut me. That means they don't totally grasp uh, the horrible situation because to be looking at 4.1 billion in cuts to K-12, another 1.2 billion in cuts to health and human services, 2.3 billion dollars in cuts to public safety, Governor Brown saying that you see uh, tuition and fees could go up to 20 to 25,000 for the year. In the area of K-12, we would be looking at suspending Prop 98, eliminating K through three class size reduction, and perhaps closing schools for a whole month. So um, the options are bleak, although as you did say, uh, there is an opportunity to do some positive restructuring. One of my last comments, though, would be that um, we certainly passed by the opportunity to get anything on a, a June ballot. And that certainly would have been great because as one who's trained in mathematics, I kind of look at this like the only sure option of realizing $26 billion total in savings in reductions would be to do an all-cuts budget, and that's the worst of the worst possibilities. But you know, if it continues that we're not able um, to have a glimmer of hope and possibly have some ballot measure, uh, this is certainly where we're headed, and the public is in, uh, entitled to understand the ramification of the full $26.5 billion in cuts. So although this is painful, I want to thank the chair and, and to thank uh, Mr. Cohen and Mr. Taylor and the uh, Budget Committee staff for working on this issue so that the public and we can all truly, and we are part of the public here, we can all t totally understand what we're faced with. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Alquist. Senator Emerson. Um, as a member of the um, Budget Conference Committee, um, the Democratic budget um, reduced general fund support to the University of California by $500 million. And despite that, um, we granted outside of collective bargaining a raise to AFSCME in, at, this, at the Conference Committee. And that is uh, on top of the salary increase that they had gotten the previous year. Um, this seems to prioritize union demands over the needs of students, and I'm very concerned about that. And I'd also like to note that according to the Department of Finance data, that since 2006-2007, employee compensation costs have increased by $2 billion, 700 million of that's general fund. And the total cumul cumulative cost is um, 10 billion, and that's 4 billion to our um, general fund. It seems as if um, we could have um, spent a lot more money in education had we been a little more careful on those types of figures that um, we uh, have used here. So I would uh, like to have the LAO comment on the MOUs, uh, especially with the out year costs, the number of days off, and the real level of savings uh, versus what the budgeted expectations were. Sure, Senator, and, and we have released per statute, we have to do analysis and we've released them for I think four of the six and we'll have the remaining two very shortly to the legislature. They're all fairly similar. Um, they all tend to um, 
achieve some savings in the near term and then tend to be either neutral or cost a little bit in the out years, primarily because you have increases at the top step that take the place of, or kind of offset the savings from the increased retirement contributions that have been bargained, but you have uh, increasing health costs over time, so they tend to turn into slight cost increases. Uh, in total, what we've been saying in the, in, in the MOU analyses is that uh, if you adopt them all, you'll be about 200 million short on the general fund of what was assumed in the 11-12 budget bill. Now, that doesn't mean that the administration may have, and, and Mr. Cohen can speak to it, if they have other plans, because it wasn't just through collective bargaining, it could be through other means to achieve those savings, but you would come up short if you approved all of those six. We also did raise, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. I, I was just going to, you made comments about the leave days. We did raise uh, concerns, and uh, not concerns, we were trying to make, just describe and make sure you were aware of what's in it. There are, with the PLP, the personal leave program, and other days, professional days, development, personal development days that have been granted, there, there is an issue there of how many, how many days off that many of these MOU agreements would grant employees over the next 12 month period. Uh, and so we just pointed that out to you and the issue of, an issue came up on whether the cash out value of some of those leave days, which we raised in the last analysis. Uh, and so what, what is the percentage of contribution at the UC level by uh, faculty and, and employees for their benefits package? I, I may need help from Mr. Sisney on that. Uh, they, they did agree to uh, resume contributions and much, much less than the regular state employees. So you know, I'm, I'm going to let uh, Jason Sisney respond to that. On, on the specifics, we'd have to get back to you, but I think that that uh, you're basically correct. But UC is in a unique situation because employees have not been contributing to yeah. their defined benefit it's been zero. Uh, retirement program for a long time, and so the university's plan. Um, which would require negotiations with their unionized staff would would basically build that up uh, over time, and they're starting from a, a very low level. So, so they went from zero to two percent, is I believe, is that not correct? I, if I recall correctly, that's, at least that's it's correct. less than five. I I think so. Yeah. We'll have to get back with you. The so we we rant and rave about efficiencies for creating more opportunities for students but we certainly don't uh, dance the dance on the other side and have a, a, an equitable situation on the, on the pay and the benefits. That's the point I'd like to make today. Well, and it has been a kind of an awkward situation because there haven't been contributions by either side, by anybody. And so they are trying to ramp back up and address their situation. And the reason why we have been hesitant to say, yes, you know, legislature approve that is because of the kind of the point I think you're raising is we want to make sure we take a look at what the state is going to do with its own employees, and then what is it willing to contribute or assume about what it would pay to UC? But the cuts to education could have been a lot less if we had, had looked at this issue over a period of time, I believe. Certainly if we had kept it fully funded, we wouldn't be looking at the kind of costs that we're going to be addressing, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Emerson. Uh, I think Senator Emerson raises a couple of good points, and I just wanted to ask if you could remind us in the past year, two, three, what percentage of reduction has been made to state employee compensation? Boy, I don't know, it's hard to characterize because uh, of the furlough days. Uh, again, they didn't work those days, so they had lost compensation. Their, their hourly rate doesn't change because you're not asking them to work, so it's a little hard and sure. to give you one number. I probably have to get back to you, Senator. I'm sorry, but, but we're probably clearly we've done double digits. I would think so. Yes. Yes. So somewhere from 10 percent upwards already in round numbers. I don't know. That sounds right. I don't know, Michael, if you have a different Mr. take Cohen? on I mean, the, the three day a month furlough uh, reduced employees pay for 14 percent. And obviously that was in place for different links. Uh, of time for, for different bargaining units, but all of, uh, or, or just about all of the units had that for uh, a year uh, plus. So, I mean, that was the equivalent of a 14.6%. 14. So let's say just for the past year, state employees, in effect, saw their take-home pay reduced by about 14%. 
That's right, and it just uh, with the the footnote that as um, units uh, came to agreements last fall, uh, and and now th that's uh, sort of transitioning to the personal leave program. And so, in the LAO letter under general government, that top line to which we earlier referred, where there's even the question of the legality. But if we were on top of that 14% and on top of additional, any additional cuts taken through the MOUs, and can you put a percentage on that? Um, I think it was a, a percent or two. Okay. So let's say in round numbers we're about 15%. Uh, if we were to, on top of all of that, reduce employee pay by an additional 9.24%, you're saying we'd save $700 million. So we're trying to hit $15 billion if on top of 15% cuts we imposed another 9%. Well, I'm not sure you can think of it on top because the furlough days have gone away now, so you're talking about kind of a new base. But they still have increased contributions, uh, and, and then that's offset in the out years by the increased step in uh, on the top of the pay scale and right. increased health contributions. So you, you do get some savings, but that's with the days restored in effect because you don't have the furlough. Sure, but I'm just trying to put this in the perspective sure, of the 15 billion and, and being cognizant, if not sensitive, to the cuts already imposed upon state workers. It's not as if they have been skating through this entire crisis. Uh, we There's certainly didn't want to suggest that. No, I think. and I'm not suggesting you are. It's just 15% is 15%. And then I'm pointing out that if we had to make deeper cuts to get to 15 billion, if we were to reduce state employee pay an additional 9.4%, I'm reading your words here, through legislation, the savings would be $700 million, a small fraction of the 15 billion we're trying to get to. Do we have a figure of what overall employee pay accounts for our $84.5 billion budget? Uh, total compensation is probably 15, 18 billion, something around there? Uh, so on the right? general fund budget, I think it's uh, about 10 is. Well, you said I was kind of, if you mean the non-educational. Right. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry, it would be less than that. S so it's in, in terms of uh, general fund sort of state employees, uh, I think it's it's in the neighborhood of $10 billion uh, so annually. So again, just for general public consumption, if we were, we've got a $15 billion hole here, potentially all to be done through cuts. If we were to eliminate every state employee, hundreds of thousands of employees, which would pretty much shut down government, uh, something we could not conceivably do, but if we were to do, just look at the numbers, you're saying about 10 billion. So that would get us to about 66% resolution of what we need to do in the next eight weeks. And just that, for a sense of perspective. Yeah, and it's a good reminder that of the general fund budget, more than two thirds of the budget is in local assistance. It's flowing to uh, school districts and local governments, uh, counties primarily. 77, I thought it was 70, but you're saying it's uh, 77. No, I'm sorry, I said two thirds. Two thirds, so, so, so it's somewhere, it's close to somewhere in the 70% okay. range. Very good. Yeah. Senator Huff. Yeah, I, I think just to reframe this a little from our perspective, when you talked about the 15% cut, that's a furlough day. So in effect, you're punishing the, I mean, we were punishing the public. They had services they were not able to get if they're going to the DMV or the other places where they need state services, people were not available. So it's not like a business that makes a reduction in force or a reduction in compensation where they still have to work the same amount of time if they're there and they get a 15% cut. This is, they get to take a day off without pay. So it saves the government money, but it doesn't, help the public that's paying for services. And also, you know, there's a lot said about how much the employees are uh, shouldering. If, if I'm reading my stuff right, our total compensation for state employees is $10.7 billion. The governor was recommending about a 300 million reduction. We ended up somewhere between 100 and 200 million reduction. And uh, that's a step in the right direction. but. That's a very, very small percentage of the total amount. So when we're talking about some sections of our budget getting totally obliterated or huge percentage cuts in others to achieve this 15 
billion dollar, regardless how we're defining it. Um, it you know, at some point, we have to make a decision about whether we're protecting state union employees or we're protecting kids or education or public safety. And it's a choice we make. But it's, it, it is what it is. It's certainly not the savings that many in the private sector are shouldering. And it just seems that such a huge number that we're spending on employee compensation that they could be taking a little bit more of a reduction so we could save some of these other programs. So I'm going to suggest that we do move on to education because oh, our time Senator is Senator Leno, oh, Senator I'm Hancock. sorry, though. I do no, have to ahead. notice that it is the public employees that uh, do build the roads, teach our kids, come when we call the fire department, and it isn't as though they um, cutting them comes at the uh, as though they were doing nothing but sitting in offices. They are, in fact, making our state work. And um, I am disturbed personally because if you really want to shut down government or kill government, uh, one way to do it is treat the people who work for it with disrespect and act as though they're part of the problem and continue not to acknowledge that 16 of our unions, at least last year when I looked, had negotiated um, very low increases, more money into their pensions. They had really become part of the solution. And uh, that we have to remember, human beings make all functions of government and business and everything else happen. So um, I can't buy a frame that says they're part of the problem. I appreciate it. Mr. Chair, I have a remark too. I don't mean to cut Se you off from thinking. Senator, Senator Anderson, go ahead. Uh, you had mentioned building uh, roads. Well, that, that would be Caltrans, and I have a bill addressing Caltrans. Uh, it's special funds, but since we're talking about it, if you take the average benefits, I mean the, the, the benefits and the salaries, you add them together and divide it by the total number of employees, all of them on average are making over $100,000. That doesn't include their pension or their pension benefits. Uh, if we looked at how the roads are being built, we've seen a huge decline in their productivity on the roads. So employees do play a role. I agree that we have to treat them with respect. But if you look in 2007 in the top 100 Caltrans workers, uh, many of them were making between ninety and $100,000. And by 2009, when our state was $24 billion in the hole, uh, they had given themselves over $60,000 raises, spiking their pensions. There are serious issues that deal with our employees, and, and I want to treat them with respect, but you know what? Taxpayers are working hard. The average salary in San Diego County right now is $56,000, not over hundred grand. And um, we've got to do better. We've got to do better for our constituents. We've got to do better for California. Thank you, Senator Anderson. I think it should also be pointed out that the and correct me if I'm wrong, the very employees to which uh, Senator Anderson's referring are engineers. Many of them, yes. With advanced degrees, yes. So $90,000 probably would go a lot further in the private sector. Uh, with regard to Senator Hancock's comments. I, I can address that if you like. It, one it does include engineers, but if we were talking about only engineers, that number would be in excess of $200,000. And it doesn't include the retirements or the retirement benefits. I mean, it's a staggering number, far exceeds. I mean, when you look at productivity, and, and you know, Senator, so we're going to have a whole hearing on this. So, since we have only, I cannot since I'm wait. Told, okay, very Thank good. You. I'm sure, you are. Uh, again, with regard to employee compensation, even if we didn't eliminate all employees, which of course is a nonsensical thing to even suggest, but if we cut our state employment in half. We'd be saving $5 billion, a third of the nut that we have to crack. So this is m much more far-reaching than employee compensation. So again, with respect to time and members who have told me they need to leave, if we could move on to education. I can be very brief, Mr. Chairman. I think I've made most of the points. If you look on uh, figure two on page four, 
I just want to make a couple of points about the education budget. And again, we will have a full hearing next right, week. Right, so I'll be but very brief. And I just that I think there are a lot of folks, at least out there, in the, especially, particularly in the education community, who have assumed that, well, we got $2 billion more because of the tax package the governor proposed. So if we don't get the tax package, it's just a $2 billion, we're just, the $2 billion is what we lose. <laughs> That's not which, the way you can think about it. Uh, I think that you would almost have to suspend and you'd have to go further whether you take our number or some other uh, because the budget that I don't think you could have afforded without revenues to propose a budget that funded it at the minimum guarantee. So I just I want to make it clear that if you don't have those revenues, I think you have to, you're going to lose more than the $2 billion, and schools should be thinking about that. What we tried to do, though, was to put on the, the table proposals that reduce the school's cost structure, not just reduce things, but try to reduce their cost. And so, for example, you see in there we have the change the kindergarten start date. This is a bill that you passed, I believe, last year that's going to phase it in, but it sets up a transitional program that kind of spins the savings. We would argue that in a time like this, this is, not, this is a reasonable thing to do. You could accelerate it and just save the money. It's a lot of money. It's $700 million. That actually reduces district's cost. So you're not asking them to change the program otherwise. You're just eliminating cost as you eliminate the money. And we think you have to look at things like that, whether it's reducing mandates co mandate cost, you may have to reduce lower priority categorical programs or categorical programs that don't have a strong record of showing what they accomplish. You should, inc you should think seriously about drastically increasing the flexibility that schools have to deal with whatever lower amount that you provide them. And you can do that by extending the flex item, the flexibility you've already provided them, by adding more items to the flex item, or you can consider broader changes that we put on the table to dramatically simplify and fix our, our school finance structure. So I think that if you, if you are going to be faced with these kind of reductions, you should think seriously about how do you minimize the impact on schools by either reducing their cost or increasing their flexibility. And as you see in the community colleges, we've also put on the table what we considered lower priority services. That by eliminating state funding for non-credit PE, that's nowhere near as serious as eliminating someone who's trying to get a transfer degree or a career tech program. And you have to make those choices, but you can make them wisely that minimizes the impact on students. So I think that's, those are the type of things that you should spend your time in the next few weeks and months about whatever cuts you do have to take minimize the impact on, on schools and give them the most flexibility as possible. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think with that, I just want to remind you at the back is the appendix that gives more detail on all of the $13.5 billion that we've provided. Um, and we'll be happy to work with the subcommittees as they go through this in more detail. Um, I would say that, as you've noted, Mr. Chairman, even if you took everything that's on this list, You'd still have a ways to go for two reasons. You didn't adopt the RDA yet, the redevelopment agency proposal. And you did adopt some of the things that are on our table in the package you've already approved. So you lost probably a billion or so because of that. So in addition to doing everything that's still on here, you'd have to do about three to three and a half billion more. But I, I hope this can help you think about how you might approach considering the kind of actions you still need to take. How do you want to use your subcommittees? Do you want to give them rough targets? Do you want to use this as a starting point and then build with other options that people come to you with? Or how you might modify some of ours if you don't like them, just as you modified the governor's proposal from January. But we view it as a starting point and we, we hope it helps you and just get the ball rolling on what you're going to need to do. Thank you. I'm sure this comes as no surprise, but could you, in a timely fashion, provide for the committee what another three to three and a half billion dollars in cuts would look like. We will be happy to, Thank Mr. You. Chairman. And digging in a little bit to some of the suggestions or proposals here, possibilities of potential cuts to get to that $15 billion number and the $4 billion plus that you have mentioned for K through 12. The conference Committee budget peg per pupil spending at about 7700 That sounds about right. And if we were to reduce by another four, four and a half billion, that might cut that per pupil funding by another? Several hundred. 
just or closer to six or 700? Do we know what that might be? Uh, we'll get that for you. That sounds okay. about right. All right. So Again, if you do things like the kindergarten date, you've reduced your ADA so you, you don't affect that per pupil funding area. But the other things would reduce it and it would be substantial and we'd be happy to get that for you. Sure. And if we were to make the, these cuts as uh, suggested or proposed, and if we were at about 7,000 per pupil, as opposed to the 7,700 in the conference report, can we compare that to where we were, let's say, in 2007? Sure. Uh, again, it's going to be down considerably, but I'll, we'll get those numbers for you, right. too. Is there any state in the country that is providing less than 7,000? Oh, I, I think there are, but it would put us down. I mean, on just a nominal basis, our per pupil funding is probably below the average now, and then people adjust for inflation and do other sure. takes on it. But if we were to go down there, it would, it would definitely drop us down the list. Edgar, do you, why, don't, why don't I let Edgar speak to that? Please. Edgar Cabral. Edgar Cabral with the LAO. Um, if you were to, um, based on the on the reductions that we provided in the letter, um, K-12 funding would drop. The number that we had with, in the budget was about seven, in the governor's budget was about 7,700 per pupil. It would go down to 6,952 per pupil. 6,952. So we right. would be below 7,000. Do right. we know the last time we were below 7,000? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure exactly what, when that would be, sure. but we could get that for you. And that would that would be a reduction compared to 2007-8, which is what we've been comparing to. That would leave you about 16% um, down. So at 69.52, we'd be 15% below where we were in 07-08. In 07-08, that's right. That's good to know. Thank you. And uh, do we also know how this might impact school districts of varying sizes? So if a school district were 75,000, 50,000, 25,000, uh, what that cut would mean in tens of millions to each of those districts? I think in terms of how that affects districts, it's less about the magnitude and really about where you make the cuts. So for example, if you cut categorical programs, there are certain school districts that have bigger pieces of their budget come from categoricals. Sure. If you make the cut from revenue limits, that'll be a, a of course. distribution. Smaller districts will probably have, often have a difficult time because they have sm less cash reserves, but um, it, it really just depends on what you're cutting. And I think I read a figure, I can't quite remember it, so it's not all that important, but with each billion dollars of cut to K through 12, what that equates into shorter school year? I think it was each day that you reduce the school year, you save 200 million. Is that right, Edgar? Yes. So five days per billion. Right, and that's just our rough estimate. If, sure. You know, assuming that you were able to, to reduce costs associated with, the, with less, less instructional days. So for example, Mr. Chairman, we, we didn't specifically have a reduction in school day. Now, right now you can reduce it by five days. We did end up with a 2.2% reduction in general fund, I mean, a general purpose funds revenue limit. If, if a district were to take all of that, from shorter days, school days, it would be four additional days. Thank you. And could you also, as you're providing information for the committee, provide the length of the school year on average in the country and what some other states are providing their students? Okay. Sarah Huff. Yeah. We're discussing education next week, aren't we? We're going to get very involved in education next week, sure. It, while you're preparing for that, it's clear we're asking you to bring some things back to us. I was wondering if you could bring back to us uh, what a 5% pay reduction by teachers, just if there's across the board, what that would look like. Certainly, that's easy. Recognizing that's like lighting a fuse on a rocket, but just to see what it looks like. And then also uh, an idea that we have often tossed out, and I believe there was a number affixed to it of about 300 million, but if you could look at what the savings would be to allow contracting out for non-classroom services in K-12, that would be helpful also. Certainly, and we have looked at that. It is difficult to put a number on it. I'm not sure that 300 is a, is a great number, but it's been a proposal we've also put out on the table as the way that you can increase flexibility, kind of regardless for what number you ultimately put on it. But we'll, we'll take one more look at it. Thank you. Senator Everson. Uh, 
You, you had mentioned some things about creating more flexibility for local school districts. And will you provide us a list of where you think um, savings could occur all, along those lines? Um, we will try. I, I think in some ways we've always used it as if you're going to make these cuts, at least provide it so it helps you do that. Exactly. I, I don't know if Edgar has some examples of specific flexibility that can do that, but we'll, we'll get back to you on that too. Oh, okay. And then uh, one other question. I, I know there's a, a state mandate um, that if a um, educator uh, gets a pink slip and then they go back and, and substitute teach after 20 days, I believe it is, that they teach during that school year, then they're provided a full salary. Is I, I believe that's correct. And I, I know my school districts uh, in Southern California say that's an extreme cost to them. And the reason some teachers were um, given pink slips was the fact that they didn't have the money to, to pay them. Uh, they had class size uh, student reductions and a, a number of issues. So I was wondering if you could kind of give us some idea about what that type of situation would uh, And cost. we have, Senator, had that on our list of things to, to consider for granting greater flexibility in those kind of hiring practices. But we will get back to you on that one, too. Appreciate that. Thank you. And then just very briefly, again, we'll address it in much greater depth next Thursday. As we are increasing unit costs at community college from 26 to 36 in the budget year, you have a note here that if community colleges were to take another hit of equal amount that we might see those costs go to 66? We have that as one of the options in here to increase the per unit fee charge from 36 that you've adopted to 66. And the reason for that number, Mr. Chairman, is pretty simple, is if you, for a full-time student, that would still, the total cost could still be fully offset by the federal tax credit assuming they had their family or they had federal liability. So in other words, the federal government would pay completely for that tuition cost for those students who pay tuition. Right. Okay. And that was why the 66, though, just so you'll know. I got it. Thank you. And with regard to the University of California, I think the president made some comments just yesterday or the day before with regard to what additional increase in tuition fees might be there? Well, as you can see from our list, we only had a rather mild, even though it comes on top of, of uh, lots of fee in increases in recent years, we put another 7% for UC and 10% for CSU. And the reason we distinguish that is UC, um, they're, they're about in the middle of the pack for comp comparison institutions for tuition. CSU is still relatively low on its comparison. In fact, I think it's still the lowest even after these increases. So again, I think it just points to you can distinguish if you do want to, if you feel like you have to go to some tuition increases, you should think about them differently and distinguish on where they are on their fee levels uh, compared with comparable institutions. Very good. Moving on, since we'll come back to education next week, if we, Senator Emerson, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, are there any other states that have um, Cal Grant type exemptions for students at the, at the university system to the degree that we have here in California? It's my understanding that roughly half of the students at the University of California and CSU uh, don't pay in any uh, tuition or fees, if, if I'm not mistaken. It, is that something that... Well, we can certainly take a look. And uh, if you could come back with us on that, I'd be curious. Certainly. Thank you. So just uh, dipping into uh, public safety for a little bit here. So without the extensions, uh, one way to look at it is that the governor had earmarked $5.9 billion dollars of the tax extensions for pub public safety programs. And you have in criminal justice and judiciary about 2.6. Yes. All right. So looking at that 2.6, uh, with regard to local public safety grant programs, if, we, if you could talk a little bit about what that impact would be at the local level. Well, as you see, the top one that we have in our list is eliminating the COPS program. 
which in effect the administration would kind of roll into realignment. Uh, it's been a separate grant program. Um, it comes on top of, obviously, locals are primarily responsible for providing these services. They have their 172 monies. Uh, it's simply that we just don't think the state can afford it. Not that it isn't used for good purposes, uh, but just as we've taken on other grant programs and local assistance, this is one that we've actually had on the table for many years. And we've resisted. You've decided that's a priority for you. Yes. So this would, in real terms, impact sheriff police, probation department? Yes. Can we translate it into how many fewer officers? Uh, you know, we could try. I mean, either just give you kind of sensitivity analysis for an average salary. If it was, if it were all used for, for police officers, for example, we could say this is roughly how many people you could no longer afford, so we, we'd be happy to do that. Okay. And then with regard to court closures, I may have to have some help from my folks here. I don't think we uh, put a date. Let's see, did we? We have the two days. Go ahead. Drew Soderberg here. For Drew Soderberg, legislative analyst. I've got, I've got to figure the two closures per month date. Oh, yes, that's closures correct. Would save about $200 million. Yeah, and what we intended that was that it would be uh, furlough days, so the courts wouldn't remain closed. It would be where uh, court employees would, you know, have furlough days, though the courts would remain open, obviously with uh, less manpower than they would otherwise have. Very good. And I know we've already cut back, I think it was $150 million in rehabilitation programs in the budget that's been passed. If we were to eliminate all rehabilitation programs, is there a savings of about 300 million? Do we know that? Uh, sorry, I'm throwing all these questions at that's you. That's all right, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Aaron Edwards with the LAO. Uh, if we were to eliminate all the remaining rehabilitation programs, it'd probably be roughly 350 million or so. About 350 million. Yeah. Uh, not a direction I would want to move in, not in a direction the senator. I, I was uh, going to say maybe to. we should eliminate <laughs> parole at all then. But the uh, reason I ask it is, of course, the resulting effect. And if you have any comments or thoughts with regard to how that would impact our already nationally high recidivism rate of close to 70 percent, clearly if we're not attempting to rehabilitate in a department that we have named uh, corrections and rehabilitation, it would certainly impact our recidivism rate and probably the amount of crime in our local communities. It would probably have some impact. Uh, it's really difficult to say precisely what the impact would be in terms of the number of crimes committed, um, but, but certainly we would expect that there could potentially be some increase in recidivism as a result. All right. Senator Hancock, any other questions on, we're, we're just, breezing through public safety. No, no, right I was just noticing that then we were shifting parole uh, responsibilities to local also in the LAO's recommendation. And um, this is, this kind of goes back to do you have a viable economy if you don't have a first class higher education system? How do you, what happens to your recidivism rate? What happens to your public safety? if you continue to incarcerate at the same rate that we are um, and there is no, uh, no rehabilitation or education going on within the prison. There was just um, an interesting column in the Sacramento Bee from a former state senator, Robert Presley, saying that it is, um, it is totally counterproductive the fact that now, under our present level of funding, uh, so many people leave prison being unprepared for a responsible role in the world. But you don't have to answer that. <laughs> Just as she do these things, if you could note sometimes the downstream implications, there might be some things that would lead to good downstream implications and some that lead to ones that might cost more in the long term. And we would readily acknowledge that, Senator, on many of these. 
And I think we'll be concluding pretty shortly, just again to uh, encapsulate the bigger picture here. Uh, we were at $103 billion general fund just three years ago. So we've cut about 18 billion. The government general fund has been reduced to about 85, so that's $18 billion, representing about 17, 17 and a half percent reduction of our general fund just in the past three years. So again, getting back to are these real cuts or not, government has shrunk 17 and a half percent. Going back two more years, would the cut, the reduction be closer to about 24, 25 percent? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I don't have that right at, at hand. I, we okay. could, again, we can look in that for you. All right. Uh, there were some figures that we were looking at, uh, general fund spending, so that we can actually compare different eras of uh, recent administrations. One metric for general fund spending is as a relation to uh, per capita. So as the population grows, demand for services grows. That in 1980, we were at about $2,500 of general fund spending per capita. That by 2000, we had grown to 3,200. But in the budget we've just passed, we're closer to 2,300, so lower than 1980 spending per capita. And then another metric for looking at general fund spending in, comparison, in comparing different administrations would be per 100, per California's uh, personal income. So per $100 of California's personal income that the lowest in recent times was in Ronald Reagan's administration. We were at about $5.05 and in the current budget, we're close to that, maybe about $5.20. I think that's right. The, um, the governor's summary actually has that chart going back for many years. It's a nice reference. Right. So we're in pretty lean times right now as we approach a potential additional $15 billion. Could you, if we were to cut that $15 billion, give us some idea of where we would land then in terms of per capita spending? with the second round of cuts and also the $100 sure. per Californian's personal income. And again, we'll have to make some assumptions, Mr. Chairman, because obviously our list is not all cuts. We do have some, some fund shifts and there's things that you can do, so we try to take that into account. Right. Um, but we do our best, sure. Okay. Colleagues, any other questions before we conclude? Yes, Senator Huff. Um, yeah, I'm trying to figure out where the best place to start is. Um, <clears throat> on your last line of questioning about all the cuts, I was wondering if the, you, you mentioned that there's been 18 billion in general fund reductions. Um, and I do recall a, a letter that uh, Mac sent to, I think, Sarah in our budget shop about programmatic spending. Can you speak to the level of programmatic spending that from our high of 2007, eight, I believe it was, to where we are now? Well, I think the letter that we provided you, uh, the $103 billion figure that the chair mentioned for 7, 8, I think in the subsequent three years, if you took into account all of the one-time stuff and the backfills and the federal funds, we were at roughly $99 billion for all those three years. Yeah, and we're at about $97 billion or something like that. I, I think right? that's right. We'd have to go back and yeah. take another look given yeah. what you've done. So, so on programmatic spending, it does tell a, dif a different story, a little right. different story. Not that you haven't reduced and it's still down, Correct. but it is different. And then if you look at overall general fund spending, it's been an, on an increase when you go clear back to 98, 99, um, although it, it dropped a little bit from last year, but that trajectory still, when we went into the recession, we were um, significantly less. Now we're at, um, in fact, in, let's call it seven, eight, 194 million versus 204 million, bil uh, yeah, billion, excuse me, now. So it's, you know, a 10 billion increase from the beginning of the recession now because we, I would say because we have this appetite for spending the programmatic level that 
we don't reduce, and so we're looking for federal funds, special funds, borrowing, all the things. In fact, in this budget, we, we're looking at now, um, through conference committee, we backed away about $1.7 billion from the governor's cuts and adopted some one-time solutions, and we've asked you for some measure of what that does to the out year. But, you know, it's, there's different ways to describe the problem. I guess that's, that's always the challenge we have here to get it in a way that people understand. But when, they, when the public believes that corrections is 50% of the budget, when in fact that's more like education, they're going to uh, have different perception of how you, you solve the problem as well. Um, so another question for you, since that was a long you know, dissertation, um, you started at the beginning of this by saying that there were some assumptions made which resulted in this list that you know, we are contemplating talking about this week and next week. So w is it safe to say that if we plugged in some different assumptions that we would have different outcomes and different things that we would be looking at? Yes. So in other words, if we said that if we redirected more money from Prop 10 or Prop 63, and we believe there's about $1.4 billion there, we could actually spare higher education, any more cuts, or name your program that we could save if we decided that we wanted to put before the voters a redirection of Prop 10 and 63, that would free up 1.4 billion so we wouldn't have to cut in some of these areas we've talked about. Absolutely. Okay, and then a different way to say that is if our priority was to protect the number of days that school kids have you could bring back to us a menu that looked like that, or if our priority was to protect public employees and you know making sure that they don't have cuts, that outcome would look different. I guess the point I'm trying to make is we have many dynamic choices. It's not a scenario like right now that we're looking at versus you know the the chaos that's going to ensue. We have many choices, and I look forward to having a further debate on some of the solutions that you can come up with that will help us go down this very painful path. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the purpose of these hearings are, Mr. Chair, and that we have gone through the regular budget, we've gone through the, the uh, subcommittees, we've gone through the regular budget, we've done the conference, we've had other debates. There were Republicans that stepped up to the, the challenge put out by the governor to show us our ideas as difficult as may be. They did that. And at the end of the day, the public employee unions are the one that said no. And um, so we're looking at other options now that are a little painful, but that goes back to this whole premise of who are we protecting? We Republicans are trying to protect the service level. We're trying to protect our education. We're trying to protect public safety. Public employee unions are protecting themselves. And that's the contrast that we have here today. And um, it's become much more difficult to do anything but a cut-related budget, but even within that, all cuts are not created equal. There are some that harm service level and education more than some other cuts. So we look forward to next week and furthering through this process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Huff. Uh, a few other colleagues have joined us. Anyone else would like to say anything before we conclude our hearing? Gentlemen, we thank you very much for your time today, for all the information you've brought to the committee, for all the information you're going to bring to the committee, and we look forward to seeing you next Thursday. Thank you, colleagues. We stand adjourned.